100 of the 613 commandments in the Torah pertain to sacrifices. Another 50 concern the priests. Suffice it to say, sacrifices are a major part of the Torah, our holy scriptures. We have had 2,000 years since the destruction of the temple to read about and to study and to think what is the meaning of the sacrifices to us now that we no longer physically offer them, but we read their words year in and year out. How do we interpret the sacrifices? What meaning, if anything, can we glean for our spiritual lives? I will share a few of my thoughts and then expand the question to thinking about rituals we still perform today, focusing on Passover, since a week from tonight, we'll all be sitting, God willing, at our Seder table. We just finished the book of Shemot of Exodus. A final third of that book is devoted to the design and the building of the Mishkan. A lot of words devoted to a three-dimensional edifice. Many people have endeavored to recreate models of the Mishkan from the descriptions. And with Rabbi Google and the chief rabbi of Yeshivat Google at our fingertips, you can find many images of said models. Last week, as I was studying the Parsha, one image caught my attention. The picture is found on the blog page of Rabbi Eli Malone, a freelance rabbi in Rockland County. I do not know if he built the model or if it was just a picture that he put on the blog post. Like a train set, this model tries to capture the Mishkan in use, including little miniature priests working with both live and newly slaughtered animals on the slaughtering table. As prescribed, the center of this main courtyard of this Mishkan has a large altar, square in shape, with four horns sticking out on each corner, and the requisite ramp going up to this altar. And it was on this altar that, yes, the messy stuff took place. Blood was sprinkled, and animal parts and flower offerings were burned. Upon seeing this image, it struck me that the Mishkan and later the temple is a homestead hearth moved into a sacred setting. Primordially, the picture in my mind is the homestead hearth is the beating heart of the family, the tribe, the community. It provides heat and nourishment, comfort, and spiritual connections and bonds. Even Isaiah understood that in his prophecy. At some point in human development, the spiritual aspect of the hearth moved to sanctuaries, communal places, communal hearths, where people could gather and worship together. We always like to talk about mission and vision. What is the mission and vision of the sacrifices that our ancestors had? I believe it was to bring the feelings and connection of the home and hearth as a way to come close with God. In many respects, that mission and vision has remained the same, even if the rituals we perform are different today. Thankfully, we don't sprinkle blood and burn carcasses on fire. Instead, we light candles on Shabbat, the symbol of peace and light. We prepare and eat special foods with our friends and our family, and we tell our story to ourselves, to our community, to our children, and to our grandchildren. Rabbi Google showed me more images as I prepared earlier this week for my matzah bites class. It was on illuminated and illustrated Haggadot manuscripts. You can Google illustrated Haggadot and many, many images will come up that you may be able to share at your Seder. 
Fortunately, some of these Haggadot, these illustrated Haggadot, were rescued from pre-Inquisition Spain, including the famed Sarajevo Haggadah. One image I noted from the Sarajevo Haggadah is an illustration of the Maror with a big head of green lettuce. Many of Ashkenazim are not used to lettuce as Maror because for many generations, only horseradish was available. And if you go to the website of the pickle man on the Lower East Side, you'll see someone grinding horseradish with a welder's mask on. We don't know if the lettuce that our ancestors used first in Spain or later in Spain and first in the Bible times was more bitter than our modern day lettuce, or if it was just truly a symbolic vegetable. Perhaps it was just a condiment giving a little bit of bitterness to the matzah and to the paschal lamb. And that the mirarim idea, the real, the bitterness, was just a symbol added later. Many of you, like me, have romaine lettuce in their salad many times a week. It is likely that I will be having lettuce for my Shabbat lunch next Shabbat. Samanishtana. What is the difference between the lettuce that I'm going to have at lunch and the lettuce that is going to be for the maror at my Seder table? There are several. One, the lettuce from maror is often served as whole leaves and not chopped up into salad form. Two, we dip this lettuce into charoset. I don't, at least for myself, normally dip my lettuce leaves into a nut mixture. We are also imagining ourselves on Seder night as slaves about to be freed, thinking about the bitterness of slavery and the sweetness of freedom. And we say a blessing, al achilat maror, God, you have commanded us to eat this maror to help us focus on the meaning of the moment. Rituals are a means to a spiritual end, mission and vision that help us connect to the divine, to ourselves, to others, and to think about the grander meanings in our world, in our lives. I encourage us to keep these lessons in mind during Seder next week, as we study the myriad of texts about animal sacrifice while we read Sefer Vayikra. This message is also the essence of tradition and change. We need to constantly work with our rituals try new ones, adapt old ones, and keep many of them just the way that they are. I conclude by exhorting all of us to see the Haggadah as a guide, as a user manual, not a formula to recite word for word. Ask questions, any questions, and share answers, any answers that will help us make this a season of freedom and kindness to all, and let us all say, Amen. Amen.